All right, everyone, we got to talk about Ebola because uh, my DMs were blowing up the other day over this story. Uh, there, were, there were reports, it's from Wired, I think, broke at first, uh, that Ebola was now curable. Oh, thank goodness, we stopped Ebola. And then if you actually look at what's being said, it's not quite so rosy. It's good news. I mean, if you care about the Ebola epidemic, interestingly, you know, like, probably 10% of people do. Uh, we've got now an effective treatment for Ebola. For the first time, a treatment that has significant impact on the death rate has been delivered, tested in real-world trials with human beings. It works. The problem is that in a remote African area, you're looking at two different numbers. You can lower the death rate to below 10% with this treatment if you get the person within the first like 24 hours of, of symptomatic uh, symptoms beginning, like flu-like symptoms. Are you likely to be able to do that? No. If you get it to them later on, once they've already started hemorrhaging, which is when you probably know they have Ebola, it lowers the death rate, but in, instead of 50% death rate, it's only about 30%. That's significant. It's definitely a lot better. It's a huge improvement. Uh, the problem being 30% death rate for a disease, let's say there's no treatment, you just have a disease out of the blue killing a third of the people that get it. That's pretty bad. The problem also is this, the methodology that they're employing, they use genetics in treatments a lot more now, which is way better than just using chemistry. Uh, so kudos to them, they've developed various treatments here that work. At least two of them are significant enough to deploy. I would say, unfortunately, if this disease is able to go endemic, as it may, because again, this isn't a cure, it's not a prevention, it's a treatment for people who are already symptomatic to prevent some of them from dying. That's great, but it doesn't help to necessarily solve the problem of transmission. You still have an active Ebola outbreak in a war zone with a population that is growing increasingly distrusting of the medical apparatus in which you have constant tension between the local and the foreign medical elements. You have a military attaché there just to defend the fucking Ebola wars. You've got a city of over a million people that may have active infections lurking as we speak, Goma. We have several other significant areas, Beni with a quarter million people, Batembo with almost 600,000 that have active infections ongoing, several new cases every day in each of them. We have a significant situation here, and you're saying that what we have is, is a cure, but it's really just a treatment. Now, that's, that's great. What I worry about, this is my big worry, my worry is that now the money will dry up, the private donations and stuff, the attention will dry up for trying to find an actual prevention for Ebola. What you should be doing is working towards an effective vaccine. As far as we can see, the vaccine that's been deployed is only mildly effective. And by the way, what happens? Okay, you deploy more vaccine and treatments. This, you know, epidemic is flush, is snuffed out. What happens the next time? What happens the next time it mutates? How do you know that this particular treatment would even work on the, the new-ish strain that uh, went through West Africa years ago? How do you even know that it would be effective? You're just assuming that these treatments would even work on every strain of Ebola. There's more than one strain already. So this is a short-term sort of thing. My, my problem is that this is going to lull people into a sense of security where they're going to think, oh, well, Ebola is no longer a problem. Number one, it's over there. Number two, it's still they say it's still fairly uncommon, like outbreaks aren't happening all the time. And we've got a treatment now, so we can all sleep safe at night. Again, the problem is the disease you don't have yet. Let's say that it goes full airborne for some reason. Let's say that that one in a billion chance mutation does occur. Are you going to really be able to deploy enough of this treatment anyway? You better mass uh, produce it. The problem is there's no profit in mass producing an Ebola treatment. Now is there? It's going to remain expensive and uncommon because Ebola is a fairly uncommon disease. It's just, it's just the way that things are going to work there. You can stockpile some. How long does it stay on the shelf active? Like once you produce a batch, how long is it any good? Like how long before you can't use it anymore or it's less effective? Months? Uh, are we talking a year? Is there a way to make it shelf stable in powdered form or something? I don't know. By the way, they're not really talking about any complications. What if the uh, treatment kills people too? Oh yeah, one in five people that gets this will die of the treatment as well. You know, we've had medicines like that that are for, in catastrophic situations, we basically give people poisons in some cases. And the poison can kill them too. Chemotherapy is a great example. Chemotherapy can save your life. It can also fucking kill you. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Sometimes the cure is worse than the disease.
You got a headache? Take these pills. Side effects may include loose stools, tight stools, no stools at all, and sudden death. Uh, and we see this time and time again. That's partially just a humorous farce because they have to listen. They have a trial of a thousand people and one of those people dies of renal failure. Doesn't have to have anything to do with the drug. They still have to list that as a possible complication. Otherwise, they can get sued by anyone who coincidentally gets it 10 years down the road, destroying their company in the process. Uh, so it's covering their ass. But no, Ebola, we don't have a cure. This is not a cure for Ebola. If it were a cure... You could get Ebola, you start bleeding out of the eyeballs, they inject you with this, and the next day you feel fine. That's not what's happening. It reduces the viral load, kills it off, helps to prevent it from, you know, continuing to replicate, I guess, and you might recover. It gives you a better chance. That's great. You know, if I, so if I go over to Africa and get Ebola, I've got a better chance of not dying. Then you've got another problem. You've got this, uh, the fact that sometimes surviving Ebola means a life of being basically crippled. We had this after the Black Death. After the Black Death, one of the biggest effects on society is that subsequent generation was very, very sickly. They were prone to everything else under the sun. Only the reduced population density probably kept mankind going in some cases. Then, of course, the Renaissance comes because their kids, they have it made. They're like, oh, we got ten times more land. There's no more feudal lords because they all ran and abandoned their land to get away from the Black Death. Uh, and so now we can do, you know, whatever we want to do, basically, and society got better. That first generation, though, that had actually had the Black Death, people who suffered from it, it's like, um, what was that one Byzantine king there? Can't remember. Uh, after the It was Justinian, I think, after the plague that swept through. Uh, prior to, I think, the Black Death at large, uh, he he got that, uh, and it left him like emotionally crippled, and he was an insomniac, and he sort of went crazy, and and started having people butchered, and, and became a weirdo. Uh, he had been, by all accounts, a fairly decent person. Uh, then afterwards, not so much. I think it killed his wife too. That might have made him go a little loopy. Uh, <laughs> if I'm remembering my ancient history correctly, I think that's basically what happened. You've got people who've had Ebola. Okay, and then they become asymptomatic and they're transmitting it sexually too. We know that Ebola can be transmitted sexually now as well, especially from males. It's not highly common, but it is physically possible for that to happen. So it's an STD after a fashion. That's a problem. As it remains, uh, how many months is it afterwards or how many weeks? I can't remember. I think it's like six to eight weeks or something afterwards. You can still potentially spread it. It's just not as common. Uh, you know, it's, that's a problem. And now you've, you've basically, you've announced to the world, well, we've got a cure for Ebola, which isn't even true. So people are going to say, well, I don't have to worry about the Ebola epidemic anymore. I'm sure it'll be fine now. Yeah, unless it mutates or unless they run out of this treatment, which is entirely possible. What if there's another outbreak of Ebola on the other side of Congo? It hits another city and all of a sudden you get a thousand more people. Uh, you know, you could have a big problem. What about other tropical diseases? Nobody wants to talk about the fact that areas that don't have any real medical apparatus now are hooked up to international trade and travel and have exploding population density. That's a problem. Nobody wants to talk about it. You've got areas where you've got half a million people crammed into tropical areas that are already prone to these diseases anyway. They're living in squalor, sharing their interior walls with five or six families. They don't even have interior plumbing. People go out and they have to shit in the street because there's no, there's no toilets. There's, a, you know, there's barely any electricity or anything. There's certainly no modern medical infrastructure in, in some shanty town outside of Goma or in Nairobi or something. Uh, this is a disaster waiting to happen. One of those places gets infected, people start fleeing, like the middle, the business class, they get infected, they start fleeing anyway to neighboring areas. They carry some plague with them, and you know, all of a sudden, a hundred million people are dead. And people in the West would like to pretend that in the increasingly internationalized world, as far as communication, trade, and travel go, uh, that it doesn't matter because it's over there. Oh, something's happening in China, who cares? That's in, that's across the Pacific. Oh, something's happening in Argentina. That's okay. It's down there, south of the Panama Canal. Oh, that's Africa, though. We don't have to worry about it. Dude, a person can get on a plane in Lagos and be here in 10 hours. That's what it boils down to. Or they could be in Shanghai, or they can be in London, or they can be in, in Buenos Aires, or anywhere else in the world. Within, like, you know, basic... What, what's the furthest flight? I think it's the uh, flight New York to Singapore or something. With a stop along the way, obviously. Crossing the Pacific from side to side as far as you can go, it's like, what, 14 hours or something. 
you know, time zones excluded. It's like 14 hours or something. It's a long flight, but, you know, it's, it's not long enough so that if a person gets infected with Ebola somewhere, gets on a plane and gets to a new location, they don't have a few days to incubate before they've got anything more than a cough and a runny nose. They can infect a dozen people during that period under the right circumstances. Good luck tracing uh, everyone who's been in contact with that shit. You know, in a dense enough area, you probably won't be able to trace it at all. Then you've got a nightmare on your hands all of a sudden. What would happen? Imagine this. What would the effect on the economy... For all you conservatives out there, you care so much about money and stuff. What would the effect be if a person with Ebola manages to get on a plane? And somehow they don't get screened properly or they're not symptomatic or whatever. They come, they end up in New York City. They're, they're, they're like, uh, they manage a food processing plant in Manhattan. And they have their flu-like symptoms. Food gets packed up, ice cream or whatever, and, you know, 100,000 people consume it before they finally trace uh, this person. They say, oh, shit, they've got Ebola. And so all of a sudden, you've got, little Jimmy's got Ebola now. He's living in fucking Iowa. Nobody's got a clue about how he got it. Something like that, a worst-case, shit-hits-the-fan style situation is possible. It would shock the economies of the world so hard, it'd probably cause a depression. And nobody even wants to talk about it. All because somebody got on a plane in the middle of nowhere in Africa, got to Nairobi, and then came to the United States or something. Perfectly possible. Feasible. Even likely long term. Eventually, Murphy's Law. What can go wrong will go wrong. Guaranteed there will be another world pandemic. It's guaranteed. That's the part that should shock and alarm you. It's virtually guaranteed within our lifetimes. Look, you live to be, I mean, if I live to be 60, 70 years old, that's enough decades there so that it would be abnormal historically if there were a major pandemic. Hell, maybe there's a 50-50 chance I'd die in that pandemic. By the way, if I ever get sick with some like Red Death or Ebola style thing, I guarantee I will do lots of videos documenting it. Maybe I'll just do like a three day long live stream. I'll just sit there and pound myself with caffeine and alcohol. You know, if I die, at least I die happy, I figure at that point. That's about all. Peace out.